wondering why a 13 year old is talking to you today. Uh, then at age of seven, I published my first book. It's called Flying Fingers Mastery of Tools of Learning Through the Joy of Learning. And more recently, I published a second book. It's called Dancing Fingers, and it's a book of poetry that I co authored with my older sister. So I really love to write, but one of the things that I know a lot of students have always talking about is that I really like to write, but I have trouble with the prompts on the state tests, or I don't like writing the prompts, or something like that. So hopefully your face doesn't look quite like that when you think of writing from prompts. But um, what is your overall opinion? When you think of writing prompts, are you a little nervous about them for your state tests? Or uh, how do you feel about writing prompts? Are you pretty confident, not so sure? I don't. I do. Uh, okay, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you feel totally confident. You're really pumped. You're ready for your prompts. Raise your hand if that's the way that you feel. Great. I see some raised hands. There's some great spirit. Okay, raise your hand if you hate prompts and you do not want to see another one in your entire life as long as you. Do. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Why? And now I'm thinking, you know, I'm pretty sure I saw some of you guys raise your hand for the really pumped up prompts. So I'm not sure if there's a, some overlap between those two categories. But whatever your face looks like when you're thinking about prompts, whether it's, or um, both of those are a little exaggerated, then I hope that you realize that prompts really don't have to be hard. Now, you might think that they're kind of intimidating, but they're really pretty simple. As in, I could make up a prompt, and, and you could all just make up a prompt like that. All a prompt is, is a topic that someone has randomly selected that they think will, be a, will make a good subject for you to write about. And so whether it's about, uh, do you think that school should have uniforms, or who is your role model, or whatever it is, the prompts are pretty simple and they don't have to be hard. So, oops, before I do that, um, what's the first thing that you do when you get a prompt on your state test? What is the very first thing you do? Raise your hand, guys. What's the first thing you do on a state test when you feel writing prompt? <laughs> Sam, go ahead. They usually read the question. You usually read, yeah, that would definitely be a good first set. You want to read it, you want to ask, answer the question, uh, see what the question is. Yeah, so number one is just to read the prompt carefully, look for keywords, and think about the purpose of the prompt. What do I mean when I say purpose here? Think about the purpose of the prompt. What it's about. What it's about, that's, yeah, that's part of it. Another one is that the purpose of the prompt is what it's trying to get you to write about. So when you take the purpose of the prompt, you apply that and you make it your purpose in writing, what you're trying to write about or what you're trying to say. So as you're reading your prompt, ask yourself three questions. What is my purpose? What am I trying to say here? Or what question am I trying to answer? Who is my audience? reading what I'm going to write, and what is my perspective? So who is your audience on a state test? The judges. Yeah, whoever's going to be reading your response and giving a score, that's your audience. Now, you probably don't know every single person who might read your piece of writing. You don't know their name or how old they are, or whether they're a man or a woman, or where they live, or what they think about the issue. You don't know any of that. And when you write, sometimes you use your audience to give you clues. Like, for instance, if you were writing to your mom and you know that you're on your on Mother's Day and you know that your mom really likes um, certain things or she really likes poetry, you might write her a poem instead of an essay. But if you were writing to your best friend who is just a real big fan of essays, you might write an essay. Okay, so you use you use your audience to determine how you're going to write. But if you don't know your audience that well, since you've never met them, likely, and uh, you really don't know who they are, you can still use clues about your audience. The fact that you don't know that much about who you're writing for, you can use that to your advantage. Um, and then what is my perspective? What is perspective? The point of view. Your point of view, exactly. Your perspective is your point of view, how you see something or where you stand on an issue. So ask yourself these three questions. What is my purpose? Who is my audience? And what is my perspective as you're reading your prompt? So what is my purpose in writing this? Ask yourself, is my purpose to persuade? Then it would be persuasive. Is it to inform or explain something? And then it would be expository. Or is it to entertain? In which case it would be narrative. So would anyone like to tell me, what is the difference between persuasive writing and expository writing?
If you're persuaded or you're informant, what's your guess? <laughs> you're persuading. You want them to like get what you're persuading them to get. And yeah. Informational. Telling you about it. Exactly. It's sort of like, um, so raise your hand if you've ever seen an advertisement on TV for fast food of some kind. I'm seeing mostly raise hands. Yeah, pretty much unless you never watch television, you only watch channels that are advertisements, and you've probably seen fast food ads. So let's say one of those uh, McDonald's or Burger King ads come on, and you're watching it. And Now that would be persuasive. It's trying to get you to get this new juicy Angus burger. Now, if it was informative, it might be something more like, this is the new third pounder Angus burger. It contains uh, 2,000 calories and uh, as well as 1,500 milligrams of sodium or something like that. So that's sort of the difference, and I just made this up, but that's sort of the difference between informing and persuading. When you see an advertisement on TV or uh, on a billboard somewhere versus when your teacher is talking to you or when you're learning something from your parents, then that would be the difference between persuading and informing. Now what about narrative writing versus persuasive expository? What is narrative writing? It's like writing a story. Yeah, it's writing a story. So for instance, if you, let's say you get a prompt and it's saying, take a stand on the issue of school uniforms. Do you think that school uniforms are beneficial and help break down social clicks? Weeks, or do they um, just lower student self-esteem or something like that? And you take a stand on your issue, um, and that would be persuasive. If you get something like um, explain the process of making a pizza to someone who has never seen a pizza being made before, that would be expository. You're explaining things. Now, if you get a problem that says tell a story about, uh, or imagine that you're whisked back in time, and uh, tell about your adventure back in time, and that would, of course, be narrative. So it's pretty easy to see what your purpose is from looking at the prompt. Another example, uh, let's say you have to write about a penguin. If you were writing persuasively about the penguin, it would be something like, the penguin is the coolest in water because it's cute, talented, and smart. For expository, you would be explaining about the penguin, informing. You're not trying to convince anybody of something. Just saying the penguin is a type of bird, blah, blah. For a narrative, it would be telling a story. You're trying to entertain. So once upon a time, there lived a penguin named Walter. Now, when you get a prompt, then you want to look at it and say, well, am I trying to persuade? Am I trying to inform? Or am I trying to tell a story? And that will definitely determine uh, which, in which direction you'll want to go, how you'll write. Sometimes, and oftentimes in life, we'll have more than one purpose. Like when you write an email to a friend. You might have all three purposes, to inform your friend that your parents just bought a huge trampoline, to tell a story, a narrative, or to entertain your friend with a story of how you already bounced off the trampoline and into the yard, and then to persuade your friend to come over to your place after school. So we, without thinking about it, we use all these things like expository writing and persuasive writing and narrative writing all the time, we just don't put that label on it. So, here's a quick activity here for purpose. Look at each of the following assignments and name the author's main purpose to explain, to persuade, or to entertain. Write a letter to a friend who is coming to visit your city. What is the number one thing they should see? Pick one attraction and list the reasons why that should be their top pick. Is this persuasive, expository, or narrative? So if you're writing a letter to a friend, you want to say, here's the number one thing you should see, and this is why. What type of writing is it? You can shout it out. Yeah. Persuasive. Persuasive. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's go through these quickly. Write instructions for building a go-kart. Shout it out. Everybody. <laughs> expository. 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 And I, mean, I heard expository at the end, and before that, that was sort of a mumbo jumbo of explode. Okay, so hopefully a little clearer this time. Imagine, imagine you've suddenly been. Uh, oh, this is funny. I mentioned this earlier. Imagine you've suddenly been pulled back in time. Where are you? What do you see? How will you get home? Describe your adventure. Narrative. 
Yes. Okay, so now when you get a prompt like uh, write a letter to a friend coming to visit your city, what is the number one thing they should see? Pick one attraction and list the reasons why that should be their top pick. What would you say? How would you respond to this? Like my city is totally lame, there's nothing to see here, you know, that's not exactly positive. So pick something. It could even be your house. You could say my house is a genuine historical site, if it if it is. Or you could just say my house is pretty awesome, you should come see it. Okay, so you you pick your site, whatever it is, okay? So I'm going to do my city, Redmond, Washington State. Now, um, you have not seen pretty boring nothing happening if you haven't been to Redmond because Redmond is fairly small, and um, our biggest event every year is probably Derby Days, which is like this parade, and um, it's like people on bikes going through the main street. So that's sort of our big, big thing. So I might say, okay, uh, Derby Days. It happens in July. It's the number one attraction you should see. Do I stop there? No. So how might I continue on? I know that you guys haven't seen Derby Days, but it's this parade. So how might I continue on? What's the next three sentences at least that you need? Details. What happens in that? You explain what it is about. You explain what it is about. Yeah, exactly. If you just suddenly, if you just suddenly received an email from someone, it was like, hey. You should come see Derby Days. I mean, that sounds, okay, for one thing, that sounds a little creepy, but for the second thing, it's not detailed. You're like, well, why? Does it cost money? Does it not cost money? Is it free? If it's free, is there free food? Because if there's free food, I might go. You know, there's all these different reasons that you would want to have. If someone just said, man, we should, we should head down to uh, the big hat store. You know, why would you want to go to the big hat store? Whatever that is, assume we'll be selling hats. You, when you're asking a friend to go somewhere with you, you usually provide reasons. And so when you get a prompt, write a letter to a friend who's coming to visit your city, what is the number one thing they should see? Just imagine that you're telling a friend about why they should go see a movie with you or something like that, and use your same techniques that you would use when telling a friend to go somewhere with you. So in my case, I might say, the number one attraction that you should see is Derby Days. It takes place every July. There's tons of free food and entertainment. Uh, we even have some pretty nice um, jazz and rock bands come to play uh, on Friday night. Plus, if you participate in the kids' biking parade, you can get a free dollar for just wearing a helmet. So I added details. And I could go on and add more details. I could expand on some of the things that I said. But whenever you're answering a prompt, don't just use one sentence. You want to continue on. When you know your purpose to persuade, to inform, or to entertain, then you can make each sentence you write work towards your purpose, to inform, to explain, to persuade, or to entertain. Next, who is my audience? Knowing your audience is important. Why? Well, imagine if Stephanie Meyer, uh, who wrote Twilight, had decided that no, her audience was not going to be she didn't think it was going to be popular with teenage girls or teenage boys. Or she didn't think it was going to be popular for teenagers at all. So she decided to write it for, uh, let's say, the five to six year old audience. Would you want to read Twilight if it had been written specifically for five and six year olds? No. No. Probably not. So usually, when people start off writing their book, they have sort of an audience in mind. Stephanie might, might not have said, oh, I want this to be just teenage girls, but, you know, when, when she submitted her book for publishing, that was kind of the natural audience that they thought of. So knowing your audience is very important. If she had said, oh, you know, I think five and six-year-old girls will like vampires and all that stuff more than really teenagers will, then, of course, Twilight might not have been such a big hit. When you know your audience, you also know what information you need to include in your writing. If Stephanie Meyer had been writing over five and six year olds, there's probably some stuff that wouldn't have gotten into it. And if you're writing an email to your sister or brother about your mom, then you probably wouldn't need to explain what she looks like or what she does for a job because your brother and sister already know that kind of stuff. If you're writing an essay about your mom for class, it would be important to provide details like that. So knowing your audience 
helps you know what to include, what to leave out. The important thing to remember is that your audience, especially on a state test, you probably don't know them, they won't know much about you or your life, so you have to introduce the topic, give the reader context. You don't want to just say, I was working in the kitchen, then Thomas walked in. He grabbed a loaf of bread from the counter, and of course now we're wondering, well, who's Thomas? Is he your brother? Is he a friend? Is he a friend of one of your siblings? You know, there's all these different choices, so explain uh, if you haven't introduced someone before. Even if your audience does know you, so imagine that you know every single person who's possibly judging your response, when you're writing for a test, it's important to introduce each topic and explain who you would talk about. If you're mentioning your friend Annie for the first time, be sure to introduce her. Not Annie rode around the corner on her BMX, but Annie, my friend from down the street, rode around the corner on her BMX. And you might even want to explain what a BMX is. A small BMX racing bike. Um, so why, why would introducing all this stuff be so important? Maybe that so you or someone else would know what you're talking about. Or exactly. Like you're about. Yeah, if you, if you just have something where it's, uh, I walked down the street and I said hi to Gloria. Gloria grabbed Thomas and we went down to the, uh, down to the mall. Then Mrs. S uh, Mrs. Smith ran into me and said hello. Um, and then I met up with Mom, who said that. Bernard was going to be seeing us later that night. Okay, so suddenly you have this whole mess of people. You may know perfectly well who Gloria and Bernard and all these people are, but whoever's reading it probably doesn't unless they hang out with you every day. So yeah, you want to make sure that whoever's reading it isn't confused. How can we make this more clear for our audience? I live in Harrisburg with Tyler, Jesse, Nana, Snowball, and Mom. Every day I ride to Burke Hills. I sit next to Pacey and Catherine. We are learning about parks. Mrs. Huxley says I am a natural. Afterward, I go over to Sasha's. How can we make this more clear? What are some things that we could describe or specify? Okay. Ladies and characters on. Guys, the mic is right here in between Dan and Sean. So when you're talking, you want your voice to kind of project that way. So you have to talk a little bit louder and in that direction so that she can hear you. Say who the characters are. I'm sorry? Go closer. Dean, say. Say who the characters are? Say who the characters are, exactly. So um, I'm going to step out of frame for a second so that I can um, be right next to the computer to type this up. So we're going to um, quickly revise this to make it more uh, interesting and hopefully less confusing. So I live in Harrisburg with who do you think all those folks she lives with are? Family, family. Yeah, Friends. with my family, Tyler, my brothers, Tyler and Jesse, my grandma, my, uh, what do you, what kind of animal do you think Snowball is, or pet? Cat. 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 Okay, my cat, Snowball, and my mom. Every day I ride to Burke Hills. Is this a retirement community? Is it the mall? Is it a school? Where? What's the place you go every day? Oh. Yeah. I ride to oh. my school, Burke Hills. Um, I sit next to Pacey and Catherine. Who would be the people you'd want to sit next to? Your friends. Next to my friends. Casey and Catherine. In class, we're learning about quarks. Mrs. Huxley would be teacher. My teacher, Mrs. Huxley, <coughs> says I am a natural. After school, I go over to Sasha's, who is babysitter, friend, relative, who is Sasha. Okay. Alright, so this might seem pretty simple, and it is pretty simple, but it's something that a lot of people forget to do because you know you're you're writing your your essay, your narrative, and you might not you might not realize that people that you know really well or that you see every day, no one else might know who they are. So 
by explaining, just adding my friends, my school, my family, a few words at the beginning when we make this confusing paragraph a whole lot more clear. Pre-writing. Okay, what is pre-writing? Everybody knows what pre-writing is. Writing, 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 writing. The rough draft? Yeah, pre-writing pre -writing is essentially what you do before you, well, it's pre-writing, so it's, it means before writing. Um, and it's the planning that you do before you start writing. Like, so, for instance, let's say I have a prompt, and it's um, many people have argued that computer games are detrimental to kids uh, because they take time away from um, when they could be doing other activities such as homework or uh, or playing outside. Do you think that computer games are helpful or detrimental to children? Please give a well-reasoned answer. So I have this problem about computer games, and I'm thinking, hmm. Well, so here I have, maybe I'll start off with my main idea, and that's that computer games teach kids valuable skills. Now, would your parents ever buy you a computer game if you walked up to them and said, Mom, Dad, buy me this computer game. Computer games teach kids valuable skills. And ended there. Would they buy it for you? No. No. So that's why, much as you would need more to convince your parents to buy you a computer game, you need more to convince me or or the person reading your prompt that computer games are really so awesome for kids. So computer games teach kids valuable skills. That's not all. I have my reasons to support that. I would say something like kids who get on the computer to play games develop skills that they can use later in life. For instance. Games like Animal Crossing require kids to develop typing skills. Or kids who get on the computer every day to play games will be more comfortable using computers later in life. So now I have my reason and I have even examples to back that up. So now your argument is starting to look a little better. But that's not all. You can add more reasons. And you could even add reasons over here and over there depending on how many you have. Three is pretty good. Um, and then this one would be computer games get kids interested in learning. Games such as SimCity and Mist help kids build critical thinking skills, which is basically just a fancy way of saying problem solving. And games such as Age of Mythology inspire kids to learn more about history. So, second reason, examples to back that up. And finally, computer games oh, help I think kids build skills or something. Yeah. Um, Researchers at the University of Rochester discovered that game players have a better ability to spot things quickly so than hand eye coordination. So now that you've supported your main idea that computer games teach kids valuable skills and you've actually backed that up, now you have a real argument about whether or not your parents buy you a computer game, that's sort of up for debate, depending on how well they know you, but you definitely might be able to convince a reader of your essay. If you have these well reasoned arguments that are really supported by reasons. It's sort of like building a house, you want to have good foundations. So tip number two is to build an outline. Now, the good news is that you pretty much have all the things that you need right there. It's uh, pretty organized, but you can also put it into a more linear format so that you have it. One, here's my idea, here's my example to support it. Now, I, there are super, super fancy outlines, but you probably won't need to use these, thankfully when you're just responding to a prompt. Like this is what you would use for both page research paper, which took a long time. But anyway, paragraph number one would be your introduction. You state the main idea of the essay and introduce your reasons that support your main idea. It was like the Derby Days. So Derby Days is the number one attraction in Redmond. Uh, it has good music, free food, and you can even get a dollar for money. So those are my three supporting examples. Kind of lame ones, but my supporting examples for my main idea. In this case, it would be computer games are educational. They teach kids valuable. Uh, they teach kids visual skills and basic computer skills, and encourage kids to think. So right there, I have my main idea and my supporting details. And I don't even stop there. I, I continue on in following paragraphs to expand on each one of those. Things. Um, but it's very important to definitely not stop at computer games are educational. Or you don't want to stop at computer games teach kids valuable skills. Because if you do, then we're really left hanging with, well, you say so, but is there any information that supports you? So you want to expand and provide a lot of examples to support what you're saying. 
Then uh, in your conclusion, you might even have a call to action, a scenario, whatever it is. And so this is a model for like a five paragraph essay, but you could even apply this when you're writing five sentences. It really can be applied or four paragraphs, three paragraphs, however how long uh, what you're writing is. You can use the same tool of writing an outline, deciding what your detail or example is going to be, and then concluding with something dramatic like a call to action or a suggestion, a scenario, a quote, or a restatement of why the main idea is important. This one is, so next time you are about to scold your kid for wasting time on the computer to playing games, take a moment to consider what kind of skills you want him or her to develop. So, um, looking back at this, sorry, I'm not down to slides. Um, looking back at this, then you see how a good outline, or thinking about your reasons that you're going to have, can let you be more organized and have something to say so that you're not just throwing down your opinion and just ending there. So this is actually from the Tennessee grading assessment, but there's, this is on a lot of um, sample tests. Most students have a person they want to be like someday. Who is your role model? Before you begin writing, think about what qualities your role model has and why these are important to you. Now write an essay telling who your role model is and explaining why. Support your reasons with specific examples and details. This is what someone wrote. Uh, who is your role model? Is a role model helps make models in the clay in art. So what is wrong with this response to the prompt? It's not specific. It's not specific. What else? It doesn't have enough details to tell you who the role model is. It's not telling who the role model is. Yeah, exactly. In fact, if you look at it, they don't mention. Oops. No. Sorry. Um, they don't mention who. <laughs> yeah, the head dropped. Um, they don't mention who the role model is. They just say something about role models in clay and art. So this is definitely one where either they didn't read the prompt correctly enough and they didn't understand the purpose, or um, yeah, I, I guess that they just didn't quite understand the purpose of it. So they talk about a role model in art. It's only one sentence. They don't expand. They don't say who their role model is, why that person is their role model, or anything. As a rule of thumb, it's generally not great if your response is way shorter than the prompt itself. Um, that's something I noticed. On the other hand, there was this really good um, response that was saying, um, and, and I'll read it quickly since it's a little hard to read, but this one starts with, My mom opens the sliding door carefully and yells, Girls, come inside. It is getting dark. I've always looked up to my mom like she's a superhero, and I want to be just like her when I get older. Who is your number one role model? This is a tough decision to make, but if you really think, it can be easy. I want to be just like my mom when I grow up because she puts family first, she cares about everyone, and she's an amazing cook. And then she continues to expand on each of these things. Now, when you compare this, which is a high-scoring one, to this, which is obviously a low-scoring one, um, what does this one do well? Jessie, she explained who her role model was and why. She explained who her role model was and why, exactly. She, she also uses really good structure. It's very organized. Um, if you look at this, she has a hook at the beginning to draw the reader in with this little snapshot of her life, her mom opening the sliding door. And then she she even asks a rhetorical question, who is your number one role model? And these are all techniques to get people reading and get them interested. So now she has her main idea. I want to be just like my mom when I grow up. So that's her main topic. Now she doesn't just say, I want to be just like my mom when I grow up. She actually goes on to explain she has all these different reasons, because she's an amazing cook, she puts family first, and she cares about everyone. So that is what you're really targeting. You want to be sure to answer the question. So start with, who is your role model? My role model is my mom. My role model is Martin Luther King. My role model is Eleanor Roosevelt. My role model is whoever it is. And then you explain why they're your role model. And if you can't think of any reason why they're your role model, aside from the fact that they're just oh so cool, then you might want to think about picking someone else. So, uh, yeah, if, if I just start off with Charlie Sheen as my role model, oh, wait a second, yeah, that's not the best prompt response. So try to pick someone who you can come up with reasons to support the idea. Um, what? So, for instance, this one's uh, Victor Mom and is able to support that really well. So, again, read carefully through the prompt and think of the purpose. What is my purpose here? Um, and then think of your perspective. So what you think about it, who is your role model, 
and think about how you're going to organize it. You might pre-write it, um, do an outline, have a web of some kind, or just brainstorm your ideas, and make sure that you have enough details to really support your idea. Understand the prompt's purpose and answer the question being asked. Think about how much you need to explain. So this was something that this person did really well was explaining all about her mom, realizing that they might not know about her, and then coming up with supporting details or reasons to support her perspective or opinion. Okay, now, um, what is word choice? Sorry if that was abrupt, but anyone want to tell me what word choice is? Word choice? Yeah, right. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. Go ahead, say it again. Choosing the right word. Yeah, pretty much. Or choosing the right words. Um, specifically, yeah, I know, it's right behind there. Yep. But, good job, guys. Good job. He's a Okay, so choosing the right words, but beyond that, um, when, when we say word choice, we think about, okay, what's a, we might think about general versus specific words, or how can we add more detail. So, word choice encapsulates a lot. Essentially, what it is, is you're being graded on word choice because it shows um, your development as a writer, and also, if you are, if you're, if you're just bored out of your mind reading something, are you going to give it a high score? No. 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 So if you, if I mean, take a little pity on whoever's grading your test and say, okay, if I submit something and it says, I walk past the big house. The big house was red. I walked into the red house. The red house was cool. Is that really that interesting? No. no. So of course you can be like, oh, this person, this, this work really isn't great, and give it a bad score. So word choice will have a lot of impact as far as whether people are interested, whether they keep reading. Avoid writing like you're writing for Dick and Jane, because that kind of repetitive, using the same words, short sentence is not a good idea. So try to use specific words that are really descriptive. For example, the word nice. You probably use the word nice on a really daily basis. You say the food was pretty nice, my vacation was nice, my mom is nice, your mom is nicer. Whatever you're using nice for, you can probably replace it in some way. Exciting, peaceful, safe, beautiful, colorful, cozy, amazing. So instead of the roller coaster ride was nice, the roller coaster ride was exciting. Because when you say that something is nice, if you say that your roller coaster ride was nice, I think of you kind of drinking tea and being very dainty, not exactly a woo down the, down whatever huge um, roller coaster it is. So use words that are more descriptive and really apply more to the situation. Replace general words with specific words. What is an example of a general word and a specific word? What if we have a child labor essay? Terrible, 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 hazardous, harmful, dangerous, killers. Exactly. So, Kill. for child labor, like for instance, yeah, if you, that's a really good example. Actually, child labor is bad. Well, yeah, of course it's bad. Be more specific. Well, child labor is hazardous. Now, when I think of bad, I think of oh, food's gone bad. You know, bad can be used a lot, so we all different connotations for it. But when you say child labor is hazardous, I think of people dangling out over a cliff with dynamite in their hand or something, which is, or people going up a chimney, which is what a lot of kids did. I'm not sure about dynamite. But yeah, hazardous really captures the idea more. So replace those general words like bad with specific ones like hazardous or brutal. Specific. A uh, dog and. Like, these are what you might think would be somewhat specific, but you can even get more specific. You could say poodle instead of dog, elm instead of tree, friendly instead of nice, booming instead of loud. Add specific details and descriptions of what things look like, smell like, feel like, and sound like. Why would you want to do that? So they get a better picture on their head? So they get a bit, uh, so that they get a better picture in the head. Exactly. Um, for those of you who have read, raise your hand if you've read Harry Potter. I see a lot of raised hands. Okay. So for those of you who have read Harry Potter, then you know uh, you 
reading through the books, you had this pretty clear picture of what Hogwarts looked like. You could see its towers and, and you know, the, the common room and all that stuff because it was described. There weren't like huge long paragraphs to describe everything about it, but you got a pretty good idea of what the, um, the school looked like. So you add specific details, you give people that picture. For example, you might even say, from the beach is beautiful, you could say something more evocative, like the beach is beautiful, the sand sparkles in the sun, and the air smells like salt and shipwrecks. Now, aside from being descriptive, it also makes your work sound a whole lot more thought out, like you have uh, taken the time to really think out what your um, scenario looks like and smells like. So, we're going to practice. Um, how do you add supporting details to my cat is crazy? This is like imagery, guys, that we just spoke about again. Remember we just talked about imagery and senses? Yeah. So add that imagery, so, add those details into that frame. The cat is crazy. And my big fluffy cat. Okay, my big fluffy cat is crazy. <laughs> okay, so you, we have this image of the sort of fat cat now. Um, what else though? And maybe we could even use a different word than big. You could say my obese fluffy cat is crazy. Now what about crazy? What do what do obese fluffy cats do when they are crazy? What do they do? Scratch. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start. Crazy. I'm gonna start um, writing a new. Uh, let's see. Okay, so my my obese fluffy cat is crazy. What would cats do that would be evidence of them being crazy? Yeah. She just flips all day long. She what? So, I, oh, I'm sorry I didn't hear that. She does flips all day long. Okay, she does flips all day long, and yet she wasn't losing weight. I couldn't figure it out. Until I saw her digging into cat food at 2 a.m. Okay, so... What else? What else would make this cat crazy? Oh, is it time for you guys to go? No. Okay, good. Um, what else? What else?